Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to this, the sixth webinar that Peace Alliance Winnipeg has organized on various aspects of Canadian foreign policy. And the impetus for this was our annual general meeting back in the spring when we realized that in order for Canadians to have some uh, understanding of why we say that Canadian foreign policy is uh, a big problem in terms of how Canada behaves internationally, is to try and break it down into various components of that and various examples of Canadian foreign policy at work. So today's webinar, this is the sixth one, as I said, is uh, about Haiti, Canada and Haiti. And in terms of Haiti, Canada has played a particularly despicable role. In, in 2004, Canada collaborated with the US and France to overthrow Haiti's elected president, Jean Bertrand Aristide who enjoyed a widespread support among the poorest of Haitians. Since then, with Canada's support, a series of right-wing governments have overturned Aristide's reforms and violently repressed his supporters. Uh, released in 2019, Elaine Briere's documentary, Haiti Betrayed, exposes the role Canada played in the 2004 coup. Uh, today's webinar will be a venue for viewers to ask the director, Elaine Briere, questions about making the film and to ask Haitian activist uh, Jenny Laura Sully questions about the current situation in, in Haiti. Uh, just to give you some brief background about our two presenters, Elaine Briere is a Canadian filmmaker and photojournalist. Her first documentary, Bitter Paradise, The Sellout of East Timor, won Best Political Documentary at the 1997 Hot Docs Festival and Production Excellence Award at the Seattle Women in Film in 1998. Bitter Paradise aired on TVO, CBC Radio Canada, CFCF 12 Montreal, BC Knowledge Network, SCN, WTN, PBS, and the Swedish National Television. Uh, the Story of Canadian Merchant Seamen, another of her films, released in 2006, aired on SCN and the Knowledge Network, and toured extensively in New Zealand, the UK, and Australia. Elaine's photographs have been collected by the Visual Arts Section of the National Archives of Canada. Her work has appeared in the Globe and Mail, the New York Review, Canadian Geographic, Carte Blanche, the Family, and the Family of Women. East Timor Testimony was published in 2004. She is the founder of the East Timor Alert Network and received the Order of Timor-Leste in 2016 for her contribution towards the liberation of East Timor from Indonesian occupation. Her current featured documentary, Haiti Betrayed, on the role of the Canada in the 2000 coup 2004 coup d'etat in Haiti, was released in late 2019. It was translated into French in the summer of 2020 and aired on TV5 in Quebec and France. Jenny Laura Sully is a researcher at the Socio Socioeconomic Research Institute and a community organizer at CLES, a center for sexually exploited women. She studied anthropology and public health and has a master's degree in biomedical sciences from the University of Montreal. She has worked as a research coordinator in hospitals and a psychosocial caseworker in rape crisis centers. Jenny is very active in the women's movement and in the movement for the human rights of migrants. She was born in Haiti and moved to Quebec with her family when she was two years old. Among the many causes she cares about, the fight against imperialism and for sovereignty of Haiti are among her top priorities. So both uh, Elaine and Jenny will, will uh, pre present for about a half hour total. And then we will uh, have a question and answer period. Uh, and we would ask that you signify that whether you have a question or a comment uh, to make by raising your hand. So without anything further from me, uh, Elaine, will you be the first to begin? Yes, yeah, I will. I'm just going to give a brief overview of how I came to make this film on Haiti. And um, I would mention it's just been um, <clears throat> aired in Buenos Aires in, in Argentina and, uh, in October. And it was the uh, opening film for the festival in Argentina. 
the National Documentary Film Festival. So now it's in Spanish as well as English and French. Anyway, I just, um, I, I was a newbie to Haiti. I went to Haiti in 2009 with my partner who was working on a, a clean water projects in Haiti. And neither of us knew very much about the country. We did know Haiti was the first independent, you know, black country in the world and the first successful slave revolution. So we were intrigued by, by Haiti, but we didn't know really very much about the politics. Um, and I often accompanied David into the poor neighborhoods where he was putting water filters in schools. And that's mainly what they did. So the teachers and that they'd have water for the school but also the neighborhood would be able to use that source of water too. And water is a really expensive thing for poor people in Haiti. It's a very hard, you know, they don't have water systems like we have, so they have to buy it by the bucket. So rainwater is a really good alternative. So uh, anyway, gradually we begin to learn more about Aristide and the Aristide years from the principals and the teachers in the schools. And, they were kind of nervous talking about it still, but the coup hadn't happened that long ago. And even in 2009, people were, you know, they would, so these discussions were discreet and they told us a lot about the improvements in health and the people in City Soleil and the poor neighborhoods had jobs and things like this. So we began to get a different picture of Haiti than you got from the mainstream media. Um, so I, I, um, I didn't intend to make a film. I was just down there doing black and white photographs for different NGOs. And, um, but I was in this uh, Shamas, the main city square in Haiti one day with a friend. And I had my camera, I was taking a few pictures. Um, and the, an elder, not an elderly man, but a middle-aged man, very nicely dressed with a nice hat on. He started shouting at me, bland, bland, you don't know what they do to us. You don't know what they do to us. So I walked over to him because I was worried that the UN police were going to, you know, take him away or something because he seemed to be accosting me or something like that. So I walked over to him and um, he actually fell on his knees and he said, there's you don't know what, he thought I was a journalist, I think, with my camera. And he said, you don't know what they're doing to us in City Soleil. You don't know what, what they, they, you know, what we suffer and we're just poor people and tell the world, tell them what's happening to us. And this was like in 2009. So it was still pretty bad. They were pretty, like the UN troops were everywhere. I mean, they went daily incursions into all of the poor areas. There was, um, foot soldiers walking through there was little you know these little jeeps with guns guns pointed out just going through just as a reminder you know and it was really hard to figure out and you at first it was kind of shocking because um it was like they were you know these people were all criminals or they had to be punished or something and this was like five years after the coup that was still happening so that impressed us a lot. But that experience really moved me. And uh, then I left Haiti and two days later, the earthquake happened and my partner was still there. So I didn't know if he survived or not because he was working in a bottom floor of a four or five story building, but the building didn't go down, he survived. He was there for four months doing water delivery and what he was reporting back was just shocking. Like they couldn't get any of the antibiotics and medicines out of the airport to deliver to people. It was, they were all being like, what the news wasn't really, really relaying very well, if, if at all, is that the earthquake was treated as a military operation and the airport the Americans were occupied with landing 5,000, 6,000 troops. The Canadians were doing the same in Jack Mao. And they were, because they were expecting an uprising, they thought the Haitians would take advantage of this. Aristide would come back. 
and there would be an uprising. I mean, it's crazy thinking. I mean, this is the last thing people would really be thinking about after an earthquake. This magnitude of the of that earthquake, you know, was stunning. And so people were just dying. That's one reason the death toll was so high. So that really shook us up. And so I, I began to uh, put together some ideas and to get some money. And at first I was just going to do a small project about grassroots organizations. But when I went down, I found out that nobody would let me film them at their meetings because they were all still afraid. And so I just nixed that idea. And I'd done a lot of research on Canada and Haiti by this time. So the film I decided is just going to be about Canada and Haiti. And there'll be a piece about the earthquake, but that's I think the focus of this story, the first priority. So I didn't have the footage to make this film. I mean, I could film and do interviews, but I didn't have the archival footage. And I couldn't have made this film without uh, Reed Lindsay, an American a videographer. He gave me two years of his work. He was working for uh, Venezuelan and Colombian television. I couldn't have done it without Catherine Keane, who made a film about the 1991 coup, and Canadian journal, you know, photojournalists, even a CBC journalist gave me footage because one of them said, well, take this footage because I couldn't get it shown in Canada. Nobody was the slightest bit interested. So that's how the film, it is it, it, kind of the, the bedrock of it is all this footage that I was given. And, uh, and, you know, once you start something, things come to you and people would hear about it. The film and they would, they would say, well, I was there and I, I did this footage. It's not very good. But some of the best footage was just uh, human rights activists or who went down and interviewed some of the key people. And no, nobody, those interviews were very valuable in this film. So anyway, that's just a little background on it. It took over eight years and four editors to get this film made until I finally got my old editor back and she did a wonderful job. And I just, it's just such a complicated story. Like Haiti is so complicated that to get it down to a, a something that people can listen to that doesn't bury them in too much detail, that was a real struggle. So, I mean, I've got enough material for four or five films. But anyway, that's the one I made. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. That was a uh, good context, Elaine. Uh, so uh, about how the film was made and everything. Uh, so that was very interesting. I guess I can uh, just start from there about the situation right now. Um, well, before uh, talking about the situ situation, um, the, the situation in Haiti presently, I think it's important to just um, um, do a, some historical reminders. Uh, so uh, Haiti uh, is uh, where Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World. I think it's important to start from there. So this is how colonialism and slavery came to, Amer to the Americas. It's important to remember that. And uh, Haiti was the first uh, successful uh, slave uh, revolt. Some people will say successful slave revolution. So I know that historians will argue about whether to call this a revolt or a revol uh, re 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 revolution. Um, but it was, they succeeded in um, you know, defeating the French and um, getting their freedom. Um, and one thing that's important to know is that afterwards, what happened there is that the, that that period of freedom lasted for a very short time before uh, the slaveholding powers, so the United States, France, Germany, most of Europe. Uh, were uh, countries that had slaves uh, uh, in different parts of the world, they ganged up on Haiti, to make a long story short. And um, Haiti ended up having to pay um, 
to compensate, like to, to pay uh, the, the uh, families, uh, the slave, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the slavers that left, that they had defeated, that had uh, left for France or that had left for New Orleans or other parts of the world, they ended up having to pay them for their loss of their slaves. So that's something we need to keep in mind when we talk about what happened to Haiti. A lot of people, uh, when you, you, you know, you're reading the media right now, they will start their article by saying the poorest country in the hemisphere, as if this is something that's, that's part of the Haitian DNA, but they never tell you about the history, why history got why Haiti got so poor. So I think uh, we need to talk about the fact that they uh, spent most of their newfound freedom paying the slave owners uh, for the fact that they had defeated them. So that, that's, that comes out to billion, billions of dollars of today's money. So we, we need to keep that in mind. So basically, let's just uh, come closer in history. Uh, after uh, that successful revolt or revolution, Haiti has known a, a, um, a period of time where uh, the United States started uh, getting involved in its um, uh, economy and then in its military and then it's in basically every aspect of Haitian life. Um, Haiti was under American occupation from 1915 to 1934. And uh, after the end of that occupation, uh, when uh, Haiti started organizing to have its own government again, uh, the United States got involved again. They, they backed uh, the dictatorship of Duvalier. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, Elaine told you about uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who came to power first in, 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 uh, at the end of, uh, well, he was a priest, he was linked to uh, 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 liberation theology, uh, he was uh, uh, seen as a socialist, and some of the rich families didn't really um, agree with him. So he was, um, he was the, at twice, he was, there was a coup against him. He was, there was a first period when uh, Aristide was there and then a second period. And the second time uh, the U.S. got involved and actually um, flew him out of Haiti and brought him to uh, Central uh, Republic uh, Santa Africain. So he was sent to Africa. And um, uh, a lot of Haitians say that this was some sort of kidnapping of a president. Um, so fast forward to the earthquake in 2010. Uh, so Elaine was talking about the fact that she was there in 2009 and that she, she left, you know, uh, uh, before the earthquake happened. That's it, right? Elaine, you left before the yeah, earthquake? Yeah, two days before, yeah. Yeah. So when, after the earthquake happened, basically there was uh, what um, a lot of um, uh, people call the invasion of the uh, Western NGOs in Haiti. So um, a lot of uh, US NGOs, European NGOs uh, came to help Haiti. And uh, basically today, what we are, um, you know, um, the conclusion of all that period is that it was a way to, um, it was a form of neo-colonialism. NGOs were used to keep, keep Haiti in a state of um, dependency towards the donor countries. And um, the US got involved in the elections and um, pressured uh, then President Preval into um, accepting Michel Martelly as um, the winner of 
uh, rigged election. So there was fraud. Everybody knew that there was fraud in that election that took, took place after the earthquake. And uh, Michel Martelly came to power with the PHTK uh, party, uh, which can be translated to the bald head, bald head party. Uh, basically, after that, when the bald, you know, the PHTK came to power, it was just uh, corruption scandals, and um, we saw that uh, U.S. companies and Canadian companies really um, were making deals with that PHTK government to have access to um, what they called like uh, to, to, to put in place sweatshops, for example, that's one thing that they wanted to do, uh, have access to minerals uh, like gold and there are other uh, rare metals in Haiti. So uh, the PHTK made that easy for those big multinationals to do that. Uh, and um, so basically, after Martelli left, he gave power to someone who would continue that same uh, policy, which was Jovenel Moïse. And Jovenel Moïse was uh, of the PHTK party. And uh, he did basically what, uh, what, what was asked of him. He was giving all sorts of contracts to foreign companies. And uh, he was involved in, in corruption, just as Martelli was. And um, at some point, uh, he decided to raise the price of um, um, oil. You know, people uh, in Haiti use oil to cook. They use it to, to, for their cars. Oil is very important because the country is not, there's no 24-hour um, uh, electricity. So when you um, uh, raise the price of oil, it's, it's really a big problem for the people. So by doing that, he was following what the IMF was telling him to raise the prices, uh, but he ended up uh, causing a, a huge revolt, which started uh, around 2019. Um, and there was also some revolts in 2018. I, I have to mention that um, the police that was trained by uh, uh, the police in Haiti that was trained by Canadian police uh, were uh, involved in massacres in city in um, uh, neighborhoods like La Saline. Uh, and there was also um, all those uh, UN scandals, uh, soldiers from the UN were also involved in scandals. So uh, basically, just to come up to what happened recently, I guess you've heard that Jovenel Moïse has been assassinated in July. Uh, so this uh, is something that has uh, sparked a lot of speculation about who was responsible for the assassination of Jovenel Moïse. There were, was talk of Colombian um, mercenaries that were there and that were probably involved. But what uh, Haitian uh, analysts are saying today is that he was probably assassinated by someone from the PHTK. There's a power struggle inside that party. And a lot of people right now uh, are trying to get power and um, make deals with um, the US and with members of the core group. The core group is um, what we call the ambassadors uh, from the US, from Canada, uh, from France, and from all those donor countries that were that were very much involved in Haitian politics after the earthquake. They sort of have meetings and talk about Haiti's futures, future, and they are part of this core group that is actually calling the shots in Haiti right now. Uh, one thing that has happened is that um, you know, the uh, police that was put in place and that was trained by the, the Canadian uh, uh, RCMP and the Canadian uh, government, that uh, police force is not, um, you know, there's, there's not a real government in Haiti. And there were talks of the uh, police uh, not getting paid, 
uh, police uh, not being sure that they would get a pension. And uh, some uh, of the members of the police have left the police and have gone on to form gangs. So today you're hearing about gang violence in Haiti. A lot of those members, the gang members, are actually ex-police officers. There is one that is called, uh, his nickname is Barbecue. His name is Jim, Jimmy Cerizier. Cerizier. He was actually a policeman. And today he's part of a big gang that's kidnapping people for ransoms. And there's another gang also called, um, so he's part of the G9. There's another gang called Marousseau 400. And they're doing the same thing. They're, they're kidnapping people for ransom. They're uh, very often blocking um, like uh, distribution of uh, goods to different cities. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, taking uh, um, resources, taking like what's coming from the uh, trucks that are, that are um, you know, distributing goods to different cities in Haiti. So the gangs are running um, Haiti, but a lot of people are saying, yes, they're running Haiti, but the government knows about this. So the government somehow is letting them do that because after 2008 and during 2019, 2020, there were all those uh, young people asking for change, asking for uh, doing protest and um, asking for a new political system, saying that they didn't want imperialism anymore. So for two, three years, you had like the, this massive mobilization of, of all, sec not just young people, there was a lot of um, uh, people uh, that, was from, that were from the middle class that were protesting and saying that they wanted a new political system millions of people in the streets. And now uh, all of that movement has been shut down because the gangs are in the streets and terrorizing people, raping women, kidnapping people. So there is, um, according to uh, many of the, uh, those who are underground who are still doing um, journalism, who are still analyzing what's going on, there, what they're saying is that the government is complicit with those gangs. This is a way of preventing the mass political mobilization that would have forced them out. The PHTK would have been forced to, to get out and there would have been a new um, political system in Haiti. So um, right now, we're, we're, it's total chaos. We see that the US government is um, not really on the side of those who want a political change. Uh, they wanna make sure that the, those lucrative contracts that have been signed uh, remain. They're also afraid that geopolitically, if uh, people that are more leftists come to power, that Haiti might uh, you know, uh, be, um, become an ally of Cuba or Venezuela. They're very, very afraid of that. So the US and Canada is going along with, with that is still supporting the PHTK. Right now, uh, you know, Jovenel Moïse was assassinated. Ariel Henry is the one who's, uh, who's uh, the head of the PHTK, but there are still power struggle inside that, that uh, party. And a lot of people are saying it's not even really a party anymore. It's like, uh, most of them, like they, they haven't organized elections. So the senators, most of them don't ha actually have any um, legitimacy to, to, to claim to power. And uh, it's like Haiti's be being run by a bunch of corrupt leaders that have links to the mafia and to the gangs. That's the, the, the situation right now. And unfortunately, what we see is that Canada still supports them. And the US is not um, helping because they have not placed an embargo on weapons because those gangs, the weapons that, are, that they're using to terrorize people, it's coming from the USA. There's a report that was done in the USA that shows that 85% of the weapons that are circulating are from the US. 
so that's the situation right now i know that that there's a lot i've i've spoken a lot i i think i'm going to stop there and maybe take your questions Jenny, I, I have one, one yeah. thing. I was reading an a Amy Willett's uh, article the other day, just yesterday, and she really emphasizes that the people who are really running Haiti are the business people. And they, if the government doesn't, you know, they're not, the government is a figurehead, but they have to do what the business people want. Absolutely. And, and the big families own all the ports, you know, are owned by different large families. And basically the State Department has been dealing with these same mafia group of families for decades and they don't want to change. So the business people, you know, she emphasized, they are kind of the real movers and shakers in Haiti and the government, like Joe now got out of line with the business people in some way. We don't know who or why, but would you agree with that? Yes, I think that when, when I say that there's a power struggle inside the PHTK, basically they're trying to get the approval of those big business families and of the U.S. Uh, embassy. That's what the power struggle is about. So they're puppets trying to make sure that the, the, those uh, mafia families uh, will support them and that the U.S. Yeah. embassy will agree. That's basically what's going on. If you have questions, please uh, signify by raising your hand on the screen and then we can recognize you. Any questions? Terry, please go ahead, unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I've got a really dumb question. There are no dumb questions. Uh, the PHTK, mm -hmm. are they white supremacists? That's an interesting question, actually. Um, it's interesting. I'm, I'm part of a group called Solidarité Québec Haïti, and uh, there's Jean Saint-Ville, who's a member of our group. And uh, what he says is that when you look at all those corrupt leaders um, like that have been in, in the government, all of them, whether they are um, Black or mulatto or, you know, whether they... they, they uh, whatever uh, their background is, all of them believe in a white supremacist ideology. Um, they, they are doing the bidding of those big families, um, but it doesn't matter what color they are because that, the, the, the ideology that they have is that there is no getting out of white supremacy. And um, so, yes, I would say the PHTK, even if you have uh, people who are, who are very dark skin color, very black, their ideology is based on white supremacy. So it's not just about what skin color they are, it's about what's in there. And in their, um, in their logic, the best that they can do um, uh, as people who want to be in government is to make sure to do the bidding of those uh, families who often, um, some of them don't even have, like, like their children don't even study in Haiti. They've studied around the world in, in um, you know, at France or the US and all of them believe in the, the ideology of white supremacy and they want to, act and, and uh, function in a way that will not, um, that will not uh, be contrary to the white supremacist interest. So that was actually a very important question that you asked. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Yes. And that is the ideology of colonialism and then its successor neo-colonialism. 
is to maintain uh, yes. this Euro centro, this Anglo, uh, US Anglo imperialism as the dominant force in the world. Uh, and we see that towards Cuba, we see that towards Venezuela and other countries. Absolutely. Are there other questions? I would have a question uh, while uh, people can think about some issues. Uh, so, so what could Canadians do to kind of spur forward uh, uh, to assist Haitians, like in terms of Canadian policy? Is there is there ways to to force the Canadian government to change or to put pressure on the Canadian government or to embarrass the Canadian government in an organized way, i.e., either through uh, MPs, uh, sitting parliamentarians, or through other actions? Uh, Mm -hmm. Is there anything Canadians could do here at home to affect that uh, Canadian policy? Uh, yes. What we have done as a group at Solidarité Québec IT is we, we did a, um, a petition that went to uh, the Canadian par Parliament and we asked uh, for uh, the, um, that uh, the Canadian government uh, makes public the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti. Uh, that's something that, uh, the, you know, I think in Elaine's film in Haiti Betrayed, there is like a little um, reference to, to that, right? Uh, and uh, lately um, uh, groups have been asking that, you know, what happened is basically is before uh, Aristide was taken out of the country, there was a meeting in Ottawa and um, there were representatives that met at Meech Lake. And what they discussed was the fact that um, Haiti's sovereignty was not um, important, basically. Just that's, that, that's what transpired from that meeting, but we don't know all the details that were discussed. So there was a petition asking for um, all the uh, information about what was in the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti. Um, they, um, there was two petitions actually. And uh, so we need to put pressure on them uh, regarding the, uh, the, the foreign policy of ca Canada towards Haiti. We need to ask them to get out of the core group. That's what we've been asking for like for two years now, and they're still part of the core group. They refused to, to get out of the core group. We sent a letter to uh, the, um, I think it was Marc Gar Garneau. I don't know if he's still the one that's uh, now with the new election. They've changed, right? Uh, we had sent a letter to Marc Garneau asking him to get out of the core group and asking that the, um, uh, that Canada stops supporting like US policy. They're basically supporting US policy in Haiti. Uh, so that's something that, that could be, uh, we need to put pressure on them to do that, to get out of the core group, to change their foreign policy towards Haiti. Okay, that's helpful to know. That's helpful to know. Um, there's a question from Maureen McKenzie in the chat, and it says, how does the United Nations human rights relate to this travesty of justice? I, I, I would take it maybe she's referring to the human rights, has, the United Nations has a human rights uh, council or a group. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that there, there are different groups that have, uh, you know, uh, tried to appeal to, to the UN about what was going on in Haiti. But the UN itself as an institution has been caught up in um, a scandal because after the earthquake, some of the um, uh, soldiers, like uh, the UN soldiers that were sent to Haiti um, were accused of spreading cholera in Haiti. Um, there were Nepalese soldiers that went there and the UN um, has yet to, you know, formally do something about this. This was proven at first, they, they refused to admit that this actually happened, uh, then they did, but um, there was no, no serious attempt to 
um, you know, give reparations to the victims that caught cholera and people who died. So the UN is itself, um, I don't know to what extent it can be viewed as part of the solution. Um, for years and years, uh, you know, UN soldiers were in Haiti and basically implementing that white supremacist ideology and making sure to keep um, a revolt from spreading. So th they've had an effect of demobilizing people who wanted to change the political system. Yes. Radhika, you have a question. Uh, I have a question and a, and a comment. I'll make the comment first. I mean, I think it's just so important this point you made about um, about white supremacy. And as Glenn pointed out, that is the ideology of imperialism. And, you know, basically it also works in a kind of uh, another way, which is that the imperialism ensures that Haiti does extremely poorly economically. And then this poor economic performance then becomes further reinforcement of the idea that the Haitians can never get their act together. They cannot develop Haiti. We need to depend on uh, white folks and all that. And it is really, I, I think that therefore the real explanations of why Haiti is where it is. I mean, uh, that, you know, the, the stories that you've been telling that, that um, uh, the, the, the other speaker who made this film, sorry, I just, uh, yeah, Elaine has been telling, they're so important because you need to keep this, uh, this stuff out. And then uh, about the UN and, and, and more broadly, I mean, I think that the, 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 the proposals you made that, you know, we have to insist that Canada get out of the, you know, the, the core group and, and all that, this is very critical. Uh, at the same time, Haiti's situation is considerably different from certain other countries, for example, Cuba or uh, 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 Nicaragua or Venezuela, et cetera, which are facing sanctions and all that. So can you give us a slightly fuller idea of what are the political forces on the ground that uh, Canadians can try to reach out to and relate to as they work in solidarity with the people of Haiti? Mm -hmm. Yes, so since 2019, there have been different groups uh, that have called themselves the uh, petrol challengers. Uh, the reason why they call themselves that is that, um, you know, following the earthquake, Venezuela put together a fund that was called Petro Caribe. And uh, all of that money was uh, the, the, the impact there was embezzlement, there was like the, that money was supposed to go to social services, but the PHTK, it's, it's the biggest, uh, you know, stolen funds uh, a scandal of Haiti in, in all of its history. I mean, even the du Duvalier dictatorship did not steal that much money, like billions of dollars from the petro Caribbean funds disappeared. Uh, so the petrol challengers were asking that all of those who were involved in that scandal be brought to justice. And um, so the, the groups that are, were part of the petrol challengers, you had uh, different names. Uh, there's a group that's still around that's called Nupap Dami. You can find them on Twitter. You can see uh, they, they're, they're still asking for a change in the um, political system. They're still asking that this time, contrary to what has happened in the past when someone was uh, accused of corruption, there was like some sort of impunity. They're saying that all of those who were involved need to face justice. And <clears throat> there's Nupab Dami, uh, there's uh, Nou Conscient, there's like, there's, they have different names. They all call themselves petrol challengers because they want to know what happened to the petro Caribbean funds. And um, right now, like the latest thing that happened is a group uh, that got together and uh, they really tried to imagine a new political system. And now they're being called the Montana group because they met at this hotel uh, called the, the Montana Hotel. And they had people that were like, you know, in Haiti, uh, there's like the Catholics, there's the Protestants, there's those who, uh, who uh, are, are into voodoo, 
and they got all these different peoples together. Uh, they got the young people, they got people like from the agricultural sector and they got together and they, they came up with uh, a, an agreement of what they need to change in the political system in Haiti. So um, this group is really interesting because they got people who usually uh, tend to fight, <laughs> you know, on the left, sometimes it's hard to, to have that unity. They got people from the left to sit together and come up with that agreement. And even some people that could be called more centrist or uh, center right were there also. Uh, what we need to do, as Solidarité Québec IT, we've said that we support the Montana agreement. And I think that Canadians need to do that. Unfortunately, what's going on right now is that the US government is trying to force people who signed the Montana agreement to make another agreement with the PHTK, with Ariel Henry. They're saying that, well, you know, let's have this big consensus and, and, and have the PHTK involved. And a lot of people are saying, no, we cannot make an agreement with criminals, basically. The PHTK is criminals. We already have a large consensus with the Montana agreement. This is what we need to support. And the US is really putting some pressure on. There's been this situation where they had sent like a special envoy. I don't know if you've heard about him, Daniel Foote, who was sent and who, um, who, um, uh, Demissioné, how do you say that? He, uh, he, uh, he, he made a pro. Oh, I see. <laughs> he quit. He quit. So he left because he said, this is impossible. You can't force these people to, to have an agreement with, you know, the, those who are part of the problem. Yes. And so now what the U.S. has done is, is they've sent back Kenneth Merton, who's the ambassador who was there when the PHTK first came to power after the, after the earthquake. So right. they're back to square one, mm. sending back this Kenneth Merton guy mm. who, who is at the, the, the root of all the problems that we're, we've seen since the earthquake. And they're saying that he's going to help broker a deal between the Montana group and the PHTK. So this is really awful. And I, I hope Canada doesn't, you know, support that. But what we're seeing is that Canada is going along with the U.S. again. Right. And 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 so just a quick follow up. Then what what is the immediate prospect in the future? Are there upcoming elections? Are there uh, any parties mobilizing for the for any elections or anything? Um, so what the uh, you know the the Montana group is saying is that we cannot have elections in the uh, situation that we have right now. Uh, it's not possible. If we do, there will be fraudulent elections. Like the PHTK is all for elections. They want elections and they want to ask money for, from Canada, money from the US, and it will be fraudulent elections. And a lot, a lot of people will put some of that money in their pockets and it will be, you know, uh, fraudulent elections. Like what we've had since 2011. Yeah. So um, right now, it's it's not the solution to, to do elections in that context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul. Oh, oh uh, thanks. I have uh, two questions, one for uh, Jenny and, and, and one for Elaine. Uh, but I'd like to thank you both for your presentations. I'm finding this very interesting and, and informative. Um, Jenny, I, I understand that Cuba has uh, over the years played a, a very uh, helpful role in, in terms of its medical aid programs. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about that and if there are other aid programs that are equally uh, deserving of praise and, and, and perhaps something that Canadians could uh, get behind and support. And uh, just quickly, my, my question for Elaine uh, would be, thank you uh, for, for uh, providing us with a link that we could give to people to watch your, your film ahead of this webinar. But um, for uh, 
people after the event is is there a, a general link that you can post that we can direct people to uh, to the paid version of your videos so that it can generate some revenue and 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 gain a wider audience yeah i can just quickly answer that before jenny gives a longer answer you um the uh, cinema politica does the streaming services for my film and it's only four dollars to rent the film in english or french and i'll give you that link yeah. And for educational distribution, I have uh, another distributor moving images. I'll give you both those links then. Okay, thanks. Um, regarding uh, uh, the help from Cuba, um, in terms of uh, healthcare, uh, the Cuban doctors have been involved in Haiti uh, since uh, before the earthquake. And they, uh, in, in certain areas of Haiti, they're the only ones there. There's no one else and they really make a difference. Uh, so there's the Henry Reeves Brigade uh, from Cuba that's been there for, um, since before the earthquake and they continue. Uh, recently, there was another earthquake. I don't know if you've heard that was an, in August. Um, and the first one there to help because they are already there on the ground in Haiti were the Cuban doctors and the Cuba, uh, Cuban uh, medical staff. So yes, I think that um, here in Canada, when we support Cuba, in a way we're supporting the Cuban doctors that are in Haiti. And uh, I think that's something we need to, to you know, look into. I was in touch with the uh, Cuban embassy here in, in Quebec to see how we can help like the Cuban uh, brigades, medical brigades in Haiti. And that's something that we can all do, I guess. Um, I don't know uh, in uh, other provinces, but I, I think it's possible to get in touch with, uh, you know, Cuban um, uh, consulate or embassy and, and see how you can uh, donate uh, to the uh, medical brigades that do go in Haiti. So that's something very, um, you know, very uh, tangible that can be done to help the people. And, and we know that, mo that money is not being squandered and it's not being wasted. It's really getting uh, directly to those who need it the most in Haiti. So I think the whole uh, uh, perspective of South-South cooperation is something that needs to be encouraged even more. And I think even though we're in the North and we're in Canada, there are ways to encourage that South-South co cooperation. Uh, so yes, definitely it's something that, that needs to be uh, supported. Jenny, what about partners in health? Yes, They've partners been there for in decades health. And, and anybody can donate to them and they're their mm -hmm. clinics and hospitals are 90% Haitian run, if not totally. And there's one not that far from the second earthquake. And um, we, yes, I would I, I, yeah, that's what we were sending money. And Medicine Sans Frontiers is also very loyal to Haiti. Medicine Sans Frontiers recently said that they've had to close down several locations because of the gangs. Really? Uh, yes. heard, yeah. So right now there's a really huge chaos in Haiti. And uh, I've heard that a lot of NGOs are leaving. Uh, the US and Canada has, has uh, uh, advised uh, people to actually leave. And there is talk of a possible military intervention. Um, a lot of Haitians are pushing back against that. They, they're saying it's not gonna help but we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks or months. Um, there, there are uh, mis, you know, some of the uh, doctors from Médecins Sans Frontières who have started to leave. That's what I've, I'm hearing mm -hmm. like in the past few days. Well, one thing I read the Montana Accord wants is for there to be training. I don't know where from, maybe from Europe, to train an anti-gang force, to train the police, and to create that right in Haiti, and to start dealing with the get to start dealing with the gang problems. So, 
you know, it would be good to hear their whole accord being published, actually. That would be something really interesting that mm -hmm. people could get behind. But that's one of the, like, they thought of everything. There's over 800 organizations yes. in the Montana Accord. It's not a little thing. It's like a huge, it's huge. Yes. It's a huge consensus. Yes, yes. But and it's unfortunate get... that, um, you know, the U.S. is trying to uh, sort of... Uh, uh, the, the the very suggestion that that accord be um, uh, mixed with what the PHTK is doing makes absolutely no, no sense. It's apples and oil. It's yeah, oil and water. It's really. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I don't see any other hands up. I just like to say these have been excellent presentations and. Uh, it just reinforces for me uh, how heavily filtered uh, the news is and information is to Canadians. Um, all that was presented about the situation in Haiti currently, um, uh, you've never heard that in the mass media here. Yeah. And it just, it just, it's just amazing um, how um, someone falls down in a street in Cuba and it becomes a, you know, a big thing for the media that this is a problem of the Cuban government. And, uh, Yet the, uh, you know, the, the level of criminal behavior in, uh, by the powers in, Q in, in Haiti, uh, not even a mention, not mm -hmm. even a mention. It's, uh, and had, had all this been happening in Venezuela, you could just, uh, you could just imagine uh, what would be said and, and so on. So I see do, I do see a question from Rachel. It, it relates to what Glenn just said and I, um, one of the things that really struck me in the movie was, which I enjoyed so much, I was so happy to see, um, was when it mentioned that Development and Peace, which is an organization I support, um, actually went against Aristide and that, you know, when he was, mm -hmm. and so it made me think just how much the mainstream media, but also a movement like Development and Peace was co-opted, I don't know, I mean, did, could you say something more about that? Because that really shocked me. And it, I don't think there was too much said, but I guess it was just the way everyone went on board against Aristide in, yeah, in the, second, was, the yeah. second time he was removed, right? Mm -hmm. There was so much propaganda. Yeah. So I guess uh, some people like from Development of Peace and other others at that time thought that, you know, they were doing the right thing. I don't think that um, they uh, they got the proper information. Basically, they were uh, they were basing their positions on propaganda, and this is what happened. I know that here in Quebec, though, there's this uh, uh, this alternative. I don't know if you've heard about them. Yeah. They supported what was going on at some point, and recently. Uh, have said that well basically we we were we were fooled we were you know we fell for the propaganda so this is something that I think we need in our groups you know as in in terms of solidarity to be aware of all the propaganda that's going on and to make sure that we don't fall for it again but they were I I wouldn't let them off so lightly Jenny they <clears throat> for one thing about 75% of the funding of NGOs come and can, comes from government. True. So they're really quasi-government. Mm. And they don't live with Haitian people. The NGO people live in Petionville. They have nice houses. They have running water. They have nightclubs. I mean, it's a good life. I mean, it's, you know, over half of uh, the funds of NGOs goes to supporting the people in the NGOs. True. So, I mean, there's just such an amount of, you know, it's an open door for corruption. And also there was one woman in, um, forget her name now, I wish I could remember, it'll come to me later, in development and peace that was, hated Aristide. She was livid. She, she was just, she was bringing these women up from these kind of fake women groups that were formed to testify to, the Standing Committee on External Affairs and just complete lies about Aristide, you know, and and she couldn't do enough to get rid of Aristide. Uh, Marta, her name was Marta 
Anyway, I tried to interview and I couldn't, but I spent weeks in Montreal trying to interview some of the people, people in alternatives, you mm -hmm. know, the umbrella group that were all, yes. in, all signed on to this accord and nobody would be inter interviewed. And some of them were really angry that mm -hmm. I would even ask them. Um, so Canada, they, they, they were, one reason I, I don't forgive them and let them off the hook is that after the killing started, they still supported what they did. They still backed the occupation for years after. Yeah. And one of the Pierre Betron or whatever, I forget his last name, he teaches international studies in, in Ottawa. I mean, he's, you know, he was one of the real adamant architects of his anti aristide policy. And now he went on to have this great career as an academic in the, the development area. And I really think it's despicable what they did because it was so, so significant. It was more important than another government doing it. If you have Canadian NGOs saying that this government has to go and that they're committing all these crimes and all these murder massacres and stuff, which wasn't true, that went viral. That's true. And that's what convinced, you know, that was very convincing. Like the campaign to get rid of Aristide is worth studying because it was international. It was in Le Monde, it was in the Globe and Mail, it was in the New York Times. And they were, and, and the Canadian NGOs, like Brian Concanon said in my film, you know, once the Canadian NGOs came on board and it was Oxfam, it was a whole bunch of them, that really swung things in the propaganda campaign against Aristide. Like it's one thing for governments to say this, but if Canadian, the good guys, NGOs are saying it, they just, it must be true. And there was an NGO that's gone now, um, it was a quasi, it was really a, the Canadian Center for Human Rights and they did something called Bitter Paradise or something report. And I still got it. And it's a complete bullshit <laughs> document. I mean, the, they went down there and they didn't interview anybody from the government, anybody from the Lavalas government. It was all people who were anti Aristide. Not only that, the people who went down to interview them didn't have any experience in Haiti. They didn't know. So it was a manufactured document. And that was really hurtful too. So the NGOs were, they weren't like, some of the, I mean, people would be going along with it because the head of the NGOs, but I think it was inexcusable, really. Yes, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. And there's Eve Angler that wrote a lot about that. I am putting his blog in there. I think it's important because he has written a lot about the, 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 the role of Canadian yeah. NGOs, Canadian companies, ca the Canadian government. So it's important yeah. to have all those details. And the call NGOs them out. were really the tipping point, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Ivan, you have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for making the film available. Uh, very powerful film. Uh, my question for either of you, do either of you kind of see the, the Western influence uh, slipping a bit? Uh, like if someone like Aristide could manage to get power again, uh, do you think it would be different uh, this time around? Are there enough countries that are, would be willing to support Haiti or do you think it would just be history repeating? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I feel that um, right now I can't imagine really um, that someone like Aristide would be able to even come close to power. I mean, the way the situation is right now, um, it's hard for, for, you know, leaders who really want the good of the people to even get close to, 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 you know, holding office in the government right now. So I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, the, the, the people who signed the Montana agreement, like they've put together all, all sorts of, uh, um, propositions for like, uh, 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 temporary uh, provisional government to to so I don't know how that would work out honestly 
um, some people are saying that the whole idea of the presidency itself in Haiti needs to, you know, to, we need to get rid of that. Like they need to have like powers in the co communes and be completely decentralized and not even have a presidency. So it's, it's really, we need to think differently about the, the political system and that's what they're doing right now in Haiti. Um, what we can do also is help like the local uh, communities in Haiti. I know that here in Montreal, like the people from the Haitian community are uh, directly helping those uh, that were hit by the earthquake, like the last earthquake and um, helping like uh, people in charge of the commune rebuilt. So it's that idea of decentralization, not going to the government and not going through the NGOs, going directly to uh, groups that are underground. So I can put the link also for that uh, uh, in the chat. But honestly, I, 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 I can't tell you that there's a clear way um, that I see the, the presidency changing on, or someone coming along and being able to, to, to you know, uh, work for the greater good and be in the government right now. I just don't see how that's going to happen. Um, Radhika, you have a question. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to underline that. I mean, the situation seems to be so uh, very complex and really difficult to find a, a way out because as you were emphasizing, uh, Jenny, that, you know, the NGOs are completely bound up with it. Somebody has put in the chat about Peter Hallward's book there, you know, uh, yes. and, and I think Rachel rightly said, you know, uh, over 50% of the funding for NGOs actually comes from government. So they have become arms of foreign policy of various governments. So you have to look very closely at every NGO that, that you think might be good, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so this kind of also leads back. I mean, really, I, I agree, of course, that Canada should get out of the core group, but Canada is so deeply involved. It's got, it's so practically all its fingers in so many different places in Haiti. For example, you know, this idea that somebody is going to train an anti-gang uh, section of the police. I mean, it's just going to lead to other forms of police repression because that's what has happened. Every time Canadian armed forces, police, military, they have gone in, they have actually increased the capacity for repression locally. They have contributed themselves to increasing the uh, repression. So uh, getting Canadians involved in any way other than to oppose the existing order, perhaps in support of this Montana group, hopefully it will last, hopefully it will have some strategy. So at the moment, Perhaps you might just maybe in closing first, looking for something more hopeful, uh, just say a little bit about exactly who are these people who are, who are these organizations, 800 plus that are members of the Montana group. Doesn't 800 plus mean rather, mean something less hopeful rather than more hopeful because there are 800 different groups. How are they going to collaborate together? You know, it, 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 it refers to a level of fragmentation, which is difficult, right? And so what will it take to create once again, a kind of liberatory force, even that will go as far as Aristide, you know? Uh, so what, what are your thoughts on that perhaps? Um, you know, I think that uh, Jean Sainville, again, I'm gonna quote him again, the thing that really we need to do is make sure that there are no Im outside imperial forces uh, meddling in Haiti's affair. Mm -hmm. And even though there is a big fragmentation inside Haiti, even though you know we're saying, okay, it's 800 groups, uh, maybe it's gonna be hard for them to implement all um, that they've agreed upon. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll make mistakes and, you know, to this point, I'm just thinking, you know what, let Haitians do their mistakes. Let those 800 groups uh, do, you know, what's good and what's bad and, and, and sort it out. Let them sort it out. But let's make sure that there are no longer any imperial forces meddling in Haiti's affair. At this point, that's what needs to be done, really. So uh, insisting that Canada, Canada gets out of the core group, that they st stop supporting US policies towards Haiti, 
that they stop correcting, uh, uh, corrupting uh, elected officials, that they don't get involved in organizing any elections whatsoever. This is our, these are our taxes, so we can demand that they stop <laughs> sending Canadian taxes to organize elections in Haiti or anywhere else abroad, honestly, in my opinion. So that's what we need to focus on. And at this point, um, we need to let the, those 800 to sort it out. And I'm sure it's not gonna be perfect, but it's going to be better than anything that will be done with the US, Canada, and, and those, those people from the core group involved. Yes. Um, I'd like to just, I don't think, <laughs> I mean, the unenviable position would be, I, I'm defending the Canadian place so the RCMP and Sûreté Quebec, but how the relationship with Canada and the placing in Can Canadian place and the, in the Haitian government happened is Aristide requested Canada to train place after the after he came back in 1994, because they were disbanding the army and they had no police force, so they needed a police force. They preferred to have Canada training them than the US. At so that, that actually went along pretty well at first. And I interviewed several placemen from that era and they, had, they felt they had good training. It's in the, in the film, I had one of the placemen and they felt they were getting good training to be good placemen and do the duty to serve and protect. But what happened is a, a couple of years, less than a year into the training, the Americans interfered and they started putting ex-members who were notorious criminals from the disbanded army in charge of every unit of the place. So what happened is the, um, the, they were underarming the place. The place were getting killed by the drunk, drug, gangs and like something like I think a hundred RCMP were trained in Gary's unit and like half of them were killed in a few years so the rest of them left and went back to Canada like there was them trained in in no I'm sorry Gary's was trained in in um Haiti but Gary had to escape because he had he arrested a major drug lord smuggling cocaine out of the Port-au-Prince airport. And the next day, the guy was out, out of jail. So he was told by one of his commanding officers, you better hide, you better. And it was only because he was protected by his commanding officer and they got him out of the country and into Canada that he survived. But his wife was raped in the meantime as punishment. So that, and I'm not defending the role of the RCMP at all after the coup in, in handling, they were in charge of the UN National Police and they both did a terrible job and they were indicted for war crimes in Ramsey Clark's um, People's Forum after. And they made no human rights report. They were supposed to be in charge of the place. But I think, you know, there's different place for different purposes and the place that were sent down to train that was promising until the Americans took it over. And then it, it's just never, it just got worse and worse. But there's a placement's union that even down when I was down in 2011, that they're still trying to be good placement and organize the play. You know, even the Haitian police aren't monolithic. There's still placed there that want to do the right thing, but they have no support. Mm -hmm. And very often they're killed. You know, we know one of them that had a little radio station and he just reported on the place. Um, and he'd been doing this for years. I don't know. And he's had, had death threats. He, had, he showed his bullet where he'd been grazed by a bullet. And he just reported on the place and had a talk show. He had gone around to like eight radio stations that got threatened and had to. So there is like, it's a complex situation in Haiti. And I think that they could sort out. They could sort it out too. How to train place they can get together and I think they can do it because they, they're not all corrupt all the police in Haiti either no anyway because as long as the Canadian government cannot stand up to the U.S. they should just get out in these conditions yes you know? I think so too yeah but uh but uh, 
anyway, just it was a complicated situation with the place for sure. Yeah. So I think that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I, Ivan's just left his hand up, I assume, uh, but I don't see any more questions. Uh, I just want to thank again, both of you for excellent presentation on Haiti. And uh, it, is, it is very good uh, to hear this information firsthand. And, and I do believe, like you say, Jenny, that uh, and Elaine, that the um, Haitian people, if they're given the right to find their own future, they'll do it mm -hmm. without interference. It kind of reminds me, I had to look this up for another reason. There's a quote from Malcolm X, which may be appropriate. And he said, I for one believe that if you give people a thorough understanding of what confronts them, and the basic causes that produce it, they'll create their own program. And when the people create a program, you get action. And uh, I think that's very true because that's, that's exactly how people sort out these situations is they take control.